Foundations of Maternal, Newborn, and Women's Health Nursing by Murray McKinney Holub and Jones, 7th edition. Chapter 10, Complications of Pregnancy. Although childbearing is usually a normal process, complications may arise threatening the well-being of the woman, the fetus, or both. Conditions that complicate pregnancy are divided into two broad categories. One, those related to pregnancy and not seen at other times, and two, those that could occur at any time, but when they occur concurrently with pregnancy may complicate its course. The most common pregnancy-related complications are hemorrhagic conditions that occur in early pregnancy, hemorrhagic complications of the placenta in late pregnancy, hyperemesis gravidarum, HEG, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and blood incompatibilities. Concurrent conditions include diabetes mellitus, cardiac disease, obesity, anemias, immune complex disorders, neurologic disorders, and infections. Pregnancy complications, hemorrhagic conditions of early pregnancy. The three most common causes of hemorrhage during the first half of pregnancy are abortion, ectopic pregnancy, and gestational trophoblastic disease. Abortion. Abortion is the loss of pregnancy before the fetus is viable or capable of living outside the uterus. The medical consensus today is that a fetus of less than 20 weeks of gestation or one weighing less than 500 grams is not viable. Ending of pregnancy before this time is considered an abortion. Abortion may be either spontaneous or induced. Abortion is an accepted medical term for either a spontaneous or an induced ending of pregnancy, although the lay term miscarriage is sometimes used to denote spontaneous abortion. Elective termination of pregnancy or induced abortion is described in chapter 27. Spontaneous abortion. Spontaneous abortion is a termination of pregnancy without action taken by the woman or another person. Incidents and etiology. Determining the exact incidence of spontaneous abortion is difficult because many unrecognized losses occur in early pregnancy, but it averages approximately 18 to 31 percent with any pregnancy. Most pregnancies, 50 to 70 percent, are lost during the first trimester. Many of these may occur before implantation or during the first month after the last menstrual period. The incidence of spontaneous abortion increases with parental age. The incidence is 12% for women younger than 20 years, rising to 26% for women older than 40 years. At a maternal age of 45 years, abortion risk is greater than 50%, about double the risk at 40 years. Paternal age younger than 20 years is associated with a spontaneous abortion rate of 12%, rising to 20% for fathers older than 40 years. About 80% of spontaneous abortions occur in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, with the rate declining rapidly thereafter. The most common cause of spontaneous abortion is severe congenital abnormalities that are often incompatible with life. Chromosomal abnormalities account for approximately 50-60% to 60 of spontaneous abortions within the first 12 weeks. Embryonic causes, such as monosomy X, 45X or autosomal trisomy contribute to chromosomal abnormalities. Another chromosomal abnormality is an embryonic no embryo or a blighted ovum causing a spontaneous abortion. Additional causes include maternal infections such as syphilis, listeriosis, toxoplasmosis, brucellosis, rubella, cytomegalic virus, and periodontal disease and maternal endocrine disorders, such as hypothyroidism, diabetes, and decreased progesterone. Um, brucellosis is passed from animals to humans from unpasteurized milk products. Other causes are related to inherited thrombophilias, which are clotting disorders, factor 5, Leiden, Anatomic defects of the uterus, uterine septum, or cervical incompetence may contribute to pregnancy loss at any gestational age. Finally, heavy alcohol consumption and heavy smoking may play a role in spontaneous abortion. Spontaneous abortion is divided into six subgroups, threatened, inevitable, and complete, complete, missed, and recurrent. 
Figure 10.1 illustrates threatened, inevitable, and incomplete abortions. Threatened abortion. Clinical manifestations. The first sign of threatened abortion is vaginal bleeding, which is rather common during early pregnancy. Approximately 25% of pregnant women experience spotting or bleeding in early pregnancy, and up to 50% of these pregnancies end in spontaneous abortion. Vaginal bleeding, which may be brief or less for weeks, may be accompanied by uterine cramping, persistent backache, or feelings of pelvic pressure. These added symptoms are more likely to be associated with loss of pregnancy. Therapeutic management. Bleeding during the first half of pregnancy should be considered a threatened abortion, and women should be advised to notify their physician or nurse midwife if brownish or red vaginal bleeding is noted. When a woman reports bleeding in early pregnancy, the nurse obtains a detailed history that includes length of gestation, or first day of her last menstrual period, and the onset, duration, amount, and color of vaginal bleeding. Any accompanying discomfort, such as cramping, backache, or abdominal pain, also is noted. Ultrasound examination is performed to determine whether an embryo or fetus is present and alive, and if so, the approximate gestational age. Maternal serum, beta HCG, and progesterone levels provide added information about the viability of the pregnancy, i.e., whether the levels are appropriate for gestation period and increase with fetal growth. There's no evidence to support physical activity restrictions to stop spontaneous abortion. The woman may be advised to limit sexual activity until bleeding has ceased. The woman is instructed to count the number of perennial pads used and note the quality, sorry, the quantity and color of blood on the pads. She should also look for evidence of tissue passage, which would indicate progression beyond a threatened abortion. Drainage with a fall odor suggests infection. Bleeding episodes are frightening, so psychological support is important. The woman often wonders whether her actions may have contributed to the situation and is anxious about her own condition and that of the fetus. New nurse should offer accurate information and avoid false reassurance because the woman may lose her pregnancy despite every precaution. Later problems such as prematurity, a small for gestational age infant, abnormal presentation, or perinatal asphyxia may occur in pregnancies that do not end with a spontaneous abortion after early bleeding. Inevitable abortion. Clinical manifestations. Abortion is usually inevitable, i.e. it cannot be stopped. When membranes rupture and the cervix dilates. Rupture of membranes generally is experienced as a loss of fluid from the vagina and subsequent uterine contractions and active bleeding. Incomplete evacuation of the products of conception can result in excessive bleeding or infection. Therapeutic management. Natural expulsion of uterine contents is common in inevitable abortion. Vacuum curettage, removal of uterine contents with a vacuum curette, is used to clear the uterus if the natural process is ineffective or incomplete. If the pregnancy is more advanced or if bleeding is excessive, a dilation and curettage, DNC, stretching the cervical os to permit scraping the uterine walls, may be needed. Intravenous IV sedation or other anesthesia provides pain management for the procedure. Incomplete abortion. Incomplete abortion occurs when some but not all of the products of conception are expelled from the uterus. The major manifestations are active uterine bleeding and severe abdominal cramping. The cervix is open and some fetal and or placental tissues are passed. Therapeutic management. Retained tissue prevents the uterus from contracting firmly, thereby allowing excessive bleeding from uterine blood vessels. Initial treatment should focus on stabilizing the woman's cardiovascular state. A blood specimen is drawn for blood type and screen or cross match, and an IV line is inserted for fluid replacement and drug administration. When the woman's condition is stable, a DNC usually is performed to remove the remaining tissue. If the bleeding is later in pregnancy, when the fetal tissue is larger, a greater cervical dilation and evacuation, DNE, followed by vacuum or surgical curettage is required. The procedure may be followed by IV administration of oxytocin, pitocin, or intramuscular IM administration of 
methyl or gonavine, methergine, to contract the uterus and control bleeding. A DNC may not be performed if the pregnancy has advanced beyond 14 weeks because of the danger of excessive bleeding. In this case, oxytocin or prostaglandin is administered to stimulate uterine contractions till all products of conception, fetus membranes, placenta, and amniotic fluid are expelled. Complete abortion. Clinical manifestations. Complete abortion occurs when all products of conception are expelled from the uterus. After passage of all products of conception, uterine contractions and bleeding subside and the cervix closes. The uterus feels smaller than the length of gestation would suggest. Symptoms of pregnancy are no longer present and the pregnancy test becomes negative as hormone levels fall. Therapeutic management. Once complete abortion is confirmed, no additional intervention is required unless excessive bleeding or infection develops. The woman should be advised to rest and watch for further bleeding, pain, or fever. She should not have sexual intercourse until after a follow-up visit with her, with her health care provider. Contraception is discussed at the follow-up visit if she wishes to prevent pregnancy. Missed abortion. Clinical manifestations. Missed abortion occurs when the fetus dies during the first half of pregnancy, but is retained in the uterus. When the fetus dies, the early symptoms of pregnancy, nausea, breast tenderness, urinary frequency, disappear. The uterus stops growing and decreases in size, reflecting the absorption of amniotic fluid and maceration, discoloration, softening, and eventual tissue degeneration of the fetus. Vaginal bleeding of a red or brownish color may or may not occur. Therapeutic management. An ultrasound examination confirms fetal death by identifying a gestational sac or fetus that is too small for the presumed gestational age. No fetal heart activity can be found. Pregnancy tests for HCG show a decline in placental hormone production. In most cases, contents of the uterus would be expelled spontaneously, but this is emotionally difficult once the woman knows her fetus is not alive. Therefore, her uterus usually is emptied by the most appropriate method for the size when the diagnosis of missed abortion is made. For a first trimester missed abortion, a DNC usually can be done. If the missed abortion occurs during the second trimester, when the fetus is larger, a DNE may be done, or vaginal prostaglandin E2, PGE2, or misoprostol, cytotac, may be needed to induce uterine contractions that expel the fetus. A DNC may be needed to remove the placenta. Two major complications of missed abortion are infection and disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Signs such as elevation in temperature, vaginal discharge with a foul odor, and abdominal pain indicate uterine infection. Cultures are obtained, antimicrobial therapy is initiated, and the uterus is evacuated. Recurrent spontaneous abortion. Clinical manifestations. Recurrent spontaneous abortion usually is defined as three or more spontaneous abortions, although some authorities now use two or more pregnancy losses as the definition. The primary causes of recurrent abortion are believed to be genetic or chromosomal abnormalities and anomalies of the reproductive tract, such as bicarnuate uterus, uterus with two horns, or incompetent cervix. Additional causes include an inadequate luteal phase, with insufficient secretion of progesterone and immunologic factors that involve increased sharing of human leukocyte antigens by the sperm of the man and the ovum of the woman who conceived. The theory is that because of this sharing, the woman's immunologic system is not stimulated to produce blocking antibodies that protect the embryo from maternal immune cells or other damaging antibodies. Systemic diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus, and diabetes have been implicated in recurrent abortions. Reproductive infections and some sexually transmitted diseases are also associated with recurrent abortions. Therapeutic management. The first step in management of recurrent spontaneous abortion is examination of the reproductive system to determine whether anatomic defects are the cause. If the cervix and uterus are normal, the woman and her partner are usually referred for genetic screening to identify chromosomal factors that would increase the possibility of recurrent abortions. 
Additional therapeutic management of recurrent pregnancy loss depends on the cause. For instance, treatment may involve assisting the woman to develop a regimen to maintain normal blood glucose level if diabetes is a factor. Supplemental hormones may be given if her progesterone or other hormone levels are lower than normal. Antimicrobials are prescribed for the woman with infection, or hormone-related drugs may be prescribed if imbalance, preventing normal fetal implantation, and support is found. Recurrent spontaneous abortion may be caused by cervical incompetence, also called cervical insufficiency an anatomic defect that results in painless dilation of the cervix in the second trimester. In this situation, a cerclage procedure, suturing of the cervix is uh, to prevent early dilation, may be performed. The cerclage is most likely to be successful if done before much cervical dilation or bulging of the membranes through the cervix has occurred. Sutures may be removed near term in preparation for vaginal delivery, or they may be left in place if a cesarean birth is planned. Prophylactic antibiotics are ordered if the woman is at risk, increased risk for infection. Preterm labor may still occur after the fetus is viable. Rh immune globulin, ROGAM, is given to the unsensitized Rho D negative woman to prevent development of anti-Rh antibodies. A microdose, 50 micrograms, is given to the woman whose fetus is less than 13 weeks of gestational age at the time of the abortion. Nursing Considerations Nurses should consider the psychological needs of the woman experiencing spontaneous abortion. Vaginal bleeding is frightening, and waiting and watching are often difficult, although possibly the only treatment recommended. Many women and their families feel an acute sense of loss and grief with spontaneous abortion. Grief often includes feelings of guilt and speculation about whether the woman could have done something to prevent the loss. Nurses may help by emphasizing that abortions usually occur as the result of factors or abnormalities that cannot be avoided. Anger, disappointment, and sadness are commonly experienced emotions, although the, intens the intensity of these feelings may vary. For many people, the fetus has not yet taken on specific physical characteristics, but they grieve for their fantasies of the unseen unborn child. Recognizing the meaning of the loss to each woman and her significant others is important. Nurses should listen carefully to what the woman says and observe how she behaves. The woman or the couple may want to express their sadness, but may think that family, friends, and often healthcare personnel are uncomfortable or diminish their loss. Nurses should convey their acceptance of the feelings expressed or demonstrated by the couple. Providing information and simple brief explanations of what has occurred and what will be done facilitates the family's ability to grieve. The family should realize that grief may last up to 18 months. Many hospitals have grief support programs that families may attend for 12 weeks or as needed to assist with the grief process. Family support knowledge of the grief process, spiritual counselors, and support from other bereaved couples may provide needed assistance during this time. Ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is an implantation of a fertilized ovum in an area outside the uterine cavity. Although implantation can occur in the abdomen or cervix, 97% of ectopic pregnancies occur in the fallopian tube. Figure 10.2 shows the common sites of ectopic implantation. Ectopic pregnancy has been called a disaster of reproduction, despite our greater ability to recognize its occurrence. Ectopic pregnancy remains a significant cause of maternal death from hemorrhage. Tubal damage caused by an ectopic pregnancy reduces a woman's chances of subsequent pregnancies. Incidents and etiology. A common factor for the development of ectopic pregnancy in the fallopian tube is scarring of the fallopian tubes because of pelvic infection, inflammation, or surgery. Pelvic infection often is caused by chlamydia or Neisseria gonorrhea. A failed tubal ligation, even if performed many years ago, 
and a history of previous ectopic pregnancy also increase the risk for an ectopic pregnancy in the fallopian tube. Greater incidences of ectopic pregnancies occur in women who conceived with assisted reproduction, most likely related to tubal factors that contributed to infertility. Contraceptions such as intrauterine contraceptive devices or low-dose progesterone agents are associated with increased risk for ectopic pregnancy. Additional causes of ectopic pregnancy are delayed or premature ovulation, with the tendency of the fertilized ovum to implant before arrival in the uterus, and altered tubal motility in response to changes in estrogen and progesterone levels that occur with conception. Multiple induced abortions increase the risk for tubal pregnancy, possibly because of salpingitis infection of the fallopian tube that occurred after induced abortion, box 10.1. Regardless of the cause of tubal pregnancy, the effect is that transport of the fertilized ovum through the fallopian tube is clinical manifestations. The classic signs of ectopic pregnancy include the following, missed menstrual period, positive pregnancy test, abdominal pain, vaginal spotting. More subtle signs and symptoms depend on the site of the implantation. If implantation occurs in the distal end of the fallopian tube, which can contain the growing embryo longer, the woman may at first exhibit the usual early signs of pregnancy and consider herself to be normally pregnant. Several weeks into the pregnancy, intermittent abdominal pain and small amounts of vaginal bleeding occur, and initially this could be mistaken for threatened abortion. Because routine ultrasound examination in early pregnancy is common, however, it is not unusual to diagnose an ectopic pregnancy before onset of symptoms. If implantation has occurred in the proximal end of the fallopian tube, rupture of the tube may occur within two to three weeks of the missed period because the tube is narrow in this area. Symptoms include sudden severe pain in one of the lower quadrants, of the abdomen as the tube tears open and the embryo is expelled into the pelvic cavity, often with profuse abdominal hemorrhage. Radiating pain under the scapula may indicate bleeding into the abdomen caused by phrenic nerve irritation. Hypovolemic shock, acute peripheral circulatory failure from loss of circulating blood, is a major concern because systemic signs of shock may be rapid and extensive without external bleeding. Diagnosis. The combined use of transvaginal ultrasound examination and determination of beta-HCG usually results in early detection of ectopic pregnancy. An abnormal pregnancy is suspected if beta-HCG is present, but at lower levels than expected. If a gestational sac cannot be visualized when beta-HCG is present, a diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy may be made with great accuracy. Visualization of an intrauterine pregnancy, however, does not absolutely rule out an ectopic pregnancy. A woman may have an intrauterine pregnancy and concurrently have an ectopic pregnancy. Laparoscopy, examination of the peritoneal cavity by means of a laparoscope, occasionally may be necessary to diagnose rupture of an ectopic pregnancy. A characteristic bluish swelling within the tube is the most common finding. Therapeutic management. Management of tubal pregnancy depends on whether the tube is intact or ruptured. Medical management with methotrexate may be an option to surgery in the woman with an early ectopic pregnancy if the tube is unruptured. The goal of medical management is to preserve the tube and improve the chance of future fertility. Methotrexate, a chemotherapeutic agent, is a folic acid antagonist that inhibits cell replication and therefore targets rapidly dividing cells, such as the trophoblastic cells in early pregnancy. It is approximately 90% effective in treating ectopic tubal pregnancy. Successful medical management is associated with small ectopic size, low initial serum beta-HCG levels, and absent fetal cardiac activity. 
It may be given in a single dose or a multiple dose protocol. The multiple dose protocol may be more successful, but the single dose protocol is less complex, is less expensive, and does not require as much follow-up as the multiple dose protocol. The single dose protocol calls for 50 milligrams per meter squared of body surface area. Follow-up HCG levels are required on days four and seven, and then weekly until HCG is not detectable in the woman's blood. Surgical management of a tubal pregnancy that is unruptured may involve a linear salpingostomy, removal of the ectopic pregnancy from the tube in an effort to salvage the tube, or salpingectomy, removal of the tube. Salvaging the tube is particularly important to women concerned about future fertility, although the same cause may affect both tubes. When ectopic pregnancy results in rupture of the fallopian tube, the goal of therapeutic management is to control the bleeding and prevent hypovolemic shock. Ruptured ectopic pregnancy is a major emergency. When the woman's cardiovascular status is stable, salpingectomy with ligation of bleeding vessels may be required. Nursing considerations. Nursing care focuses on prevention or early identification of hypovolemic shock, pain control, and psychological support for the woman who experiences ectopic pregnancy. Nurses monitor the woman for signs and symptoms that suggest tubal rupture or bleeding, e.g. pelvic, shoulder, or neck pain, dizziness or faintness, increased vaginal bleeding. Nurses administer ordered analgesics and evaluate their effectiveness so pain can be adequately controlled. The nurse administers RH immune globulin to Rho D negative women. If the plan of care includes methotrexate, the nurse should be aware that methotrexate is a chemotherapeutic agent. Facility protocols for chemotherapy should be followed, including appropriate personal protective equipment, double glove, and verification of patient name, medication, and dosage by another nurse. Air should not be expelled from the syringe because it could aerosolize the medication. The woman should be taught that her urine is considered toxic for 72 hours. She should be careful to avoid getting urine on the toilet seat. The toilet should be flushed twice with the lid closed when she voids. Additional patient teaching includes adverse side effects such as nausea and vomiting and the importance of informing the healthcare team of any physical changes. Transient abdominal pain occurs during methotrexate therapy, probably because of expulsion of the products of conception from the tube. The woman also should be instructed to refrain from drinking alcohol, which decreases the effectiveness of methotrexate. Taking vitamins that contain folic acid, using NSAIDs, and having sexual intercourse until beta-HCG is not detectable in her blood. If the treatment is successful, this hormone disappears from plasma within two to three weeks. Maintaining follow-up appointments is essential to identify whether the HCG titer becomes negative and remains negative. Continued presence of HCG in the serum requires follow-up to identify whether the atopic pregnancy is still present. The woman and her family will need psychological support to deal with intense emotions that may include anger, grief, guilt, and self-blame. The woman also may be anxious about her ability to become pregnant in the future. Because ectopic pregnancy may occur when a woman has undergone an assisted reproductive procedure, she may be more anxious about when she might become pregnant again and if similar risks exist for another pregnancy. The nurse should clarify the physician's explanation and use therapeutic communication techniques that assist the woman to deal with her anxiety. Gestational trophoblastic disease Hydatidiform mole. Hydatidiform mole is one form of gestational trophoblastic disease, which occurs when trophoblasts, peripheral cells that attach the fertilized ovum to the uterine wall, develop abnormally. The placenta does not develop normally, and if a fetus is present, there will be a fatal chromosome defect. Gestational trophoblastic disease is characterized by proliferation and edema. Of the chorionic villi. The fluid filled villi form grape like clusters of tissue that can rapidly grow large enough to fill the uterus to the size of an advanced pregnancy. The mole may be complete with no fetus present or partial 
in which fetal tissue or membranes are present. Incidence and etiology. In the United States and Europe, the incidence of hydatidiform mole is one in every 1,000 to 1,500 pregnancies. Age is a factor, with the frequency of molar pregnancies highest at both ends of reproductive life. The incidence is higher among Asian women. Women who have had one molar pregnancy have a greater risk to have another in a subsequent pregnancy. Persistent gestational trophoblastic disease may undergo malignant change, choriocarcinoma, and may metastasize to such sites as a lung, vagina, liver, and brain. Complete mole is thought to occur when the ovum is fertilized by a sperm that duplicates its own chromosomes and the maternal chromosomes in the ovum are inactivated. In a partial mole, the maternal contribution is usually present, but the paternal contribution is doubled, and therefore the karyotype is triploid, 69XXY or 69XYY. If a fetus is identified with the partial mole, it is grossly abnormal because of the abnormal chromosomal composition. Clinical Manifestations Routine use of ultrasound allows earlier diagnosis of hydatidiform mole, usually before the most severe manifestations of the disorder develop. Possible signs and symptoms of molar pregnancy include the following. Higher levels of beta-HCG than expected for gestation. Characteristic snowstorm ultrasound pattern that shows the vesicles and the absence of a fetal sac or fetal heart activity in a complete molar pregnancy a uterus that is larger than expected for gestational age, vaginal bleeding, which varies from dark brown spotting to profuse hemorrhage, excessive nausea and vomiting, or hyperemesis gravidarum, HEG, may be related to high levels of beta-HCG from the proliferating trophoblasts. Early development of preeclampsia before 24 weeks gestation in an otherwise normal pregnancy. Diagnosis. Measures of beta-HCG levels detect the abnormally high levels of the hormone before treatment. After treatment, beta-HCG levels are measured to determine whether they fall and then disappear. In addition to the characteristic patterns showing the vesicles, ultrasound examination allows a differential diagnosis to be made between two types of molar pregnancies. One, a partial mole that includes some fetal tissue and membranes and two, a complete mole that is composed only of enlarged villi but contains no fetal tissue or membranes. Therapeutic management. Medical management includes two phases. One, evacuation of the trophoblastic tissue of the mole, and two, continuous follow-up of the woman to detect malignant changes of any remaining trophoblastic tissue. At the same time, the woman is treated for any other problems such as preeclampsia or Hyperemesis gravidarum, HUG. Before evacuation, chest radiography, computed tomography, CT, or MRI, may be performed to detect metastatic disease. A complete blood count, laboratory assessment of coagulation status, and blood type screening or cross matching are also necessary in case a transfusion is needed. Blood chemistry examinations are done to evaluate renal, hepatic, and thyroid function. The mole usually is removed by vacuum aspiration followed by curatage. After tissue removal, IV oxytocin is given to contract the uterus. Avoiding uterine stimulation with oxytocin before evacuation is important. Uterine contractions can cause trophoblastic tissue to be pulled into the large venous sinusoids in the uterus, resulting in embolization of tissue and respiratory distress. The tissue obtained is sent for laboratory evaluation. Although a hydatidiform mole is usually a benign process, choriocarcinoma may occur. Follow-up is critical to detect changes suggestive of trophoblastic malignancy. Beta-HCG is repeated at six weeks postpartum. Follow-up protocol involves evaluation of serum beta-HCG levels monthly for six months, then every two to three months for six months until normal for three values. A persistent or rising beta-HCG level suggests continued gestational trophoblastic disease. Pregnancy must be avoided during the follow-up because the normal rise of beta-HCG level is pre in pregnancy would obscure evidence of choriocarcinoma. Nursing considerations. Bleeding is possible complication with a molar pregnancy, but emotional care of the woman is also essential. Women who have a hydatidiform mole experience emotions similar to those of women who have experienced any other type of pregnancy loss. 
In addition, they may be anxious about follow-up evaluations, the possibility of malignant change, and the need to delay pregnancy for at least one year. Application of the nursing process, hemorrhagic conditions of early pregnancy. Regardless of the cause of early antepartum bleeding, nurses play a vital role in its management. Nurses are responsible for monitoring the condition of the pregnant woman and for collaborating with the physician to provide treatment. Assessment. Confirmation of pregnancy and length of gestation are important initial data to obtain. Physical assessment focuses on determining the amount of bleeding and the description, location, and severity of pain. Estimate the amount of vaginal bleeding by examining the linen and peripads. If necessary, accurately assess the bleeding by weighing linen and peripads. One gram weight equals one milliliter volume. When asking a woman how much blood she lost at home, ask her to compare the amount lost with a common liquid measure such as a tablespoon or a cup. Ask also how long the bleeding episode lasted and what was done to control the bleeding. Bleeding may be accompanied by pain. Uterine cramping usually accompanies spontaneous abortion. Deep severe pelvic pain is associated with ruptured ectopic pregnancy. In ruptured ectopic pregnancy, bleeding may be concealed and pain could be the only symptom. Vital signs and urine output give a clue to her cardiovascular status. A rising pulse rate and respiratory rate and falling urine output are associated with hypovolemia. The blood pressure usually falls late in hypovolemic shock. Check laboratory values for hemoglobin and hematocrit and report abnormal values to the healthcare provider. Check laboratory values for coagulation factors to identify added risks for hemorrhage. Administer RH immune globulin to appropriate Rho D negative women. Because vaginal bleeding and necessary medical interventions may be associated with infections, assess the woman for fever, elevated pulse rate, malaise, and prolonged or malodorous vaginal discharge. Determine the family's knowledge of needed follow-up care and how to prevent complications such as infection. Identification of patient problems. A variety of collaborative problems or nursing diagnoses should be considered if in the woman who has a bleeding disorder of early pregnancy. Collaborative problems such as bleeding and potential for infection are present. Current diagnostic techniques often permit early diagnosis before hemorrhage occurs. An applicable patient problem for women with these early pregnancy disorders is need for patient teaching about diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, signs and symptoms of additional complications, measures to prevent infection, and importance of follow-up care. Planning expected outcomes. Goals and expected outcomes for this nursing diagnosis are that the woman will do the following. Verbalize understanding of diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Verbalize measures to prevent infection. Verbalize signs of infection to report to the healthcare provider. Maintain follow-up care. Interventions. Provide information about tests and procedures. Women and their families experience less anxiety if they understand what is happening. Explain planned diagnostic procedures such as transvaginal or transabdominal ultrasonography. Include the purpose of the tests. How long? they will take and whether the procedures cause discomfort. Briefly describe the reasons for blood tests such as evaluation of HCG, hemoglobin, hematocrit, or coagulation factors. Explain that diagnostic and therapeutic measures sometimes must be performed quickly to prevent excessive blood loss. If surgical intervention is necessary, reinforce the explanations from the anesthesia professional about planned anesthesia. Obtain needed consents before procedures. Teach measures to prevent infection. The risk for infection is greatest during the first 72 hours after spontaneous abortion or operative procedures. Personal hygiene should include daily showers and careful hand washing before and after changing perennial pads. Perennial pads applied in a front-to-back direction should be used instead of tampons until bleeding has subsided. The woman should consult with a healthcare provider about safe timing for resuming intercourse. Provide dietary information. Nutrition and adequate fluid intake help maintain the body's defense against infection, and the nurse should promote an adequate and culturally sensitive diet. The woman who has a hemorrhagic complication is also at risk for infection. She needs foods that are high in iron to increase hematocrit and hemoglobin values. These foods include liver, red meat, dried fruits, dried peas and beans, and dark green leafy vegetables. Foods high in vitamin C include citrus fruits, broccoli, strawberries, cantaloupe, cabbage, and green peppers. Adequate fluid intake promotes hydration after bleeding episodes, and maintains digestive processes. Iron supplementation is often prescribed, and a woman may require information on how to lessen the gastrointestinal upset that many people experience when iron is administered. 
Less gastric upset is experienced when iron is taken with meals. Iron supplements having a slow release may be better tolerated. A diet high in fiber and fluid helps reduce the commonly associated constipation. Teach signs of infection to report. Ensure that the woman has a thermometer at home and knows how to use it. Tell her to take her temperature every eight hours for the first three days at home. Teach the woman to seek medical help if her temperature rises above 100.4 Fahrenheit, 38 degrees Celsius, or as her physician instructs. She also should report other signs of infections, even if she does not have a fever, such as vaginal discharge with followed or pelvic tenderness, or persistent general malaise. Reinforce follow-up care. The woman with gestational trophoblastic disease, such as hydatid mole, requires follow-up every one to two weeks for evaluation of serum beta HCG levels. Immunologic or genetic testing and counseling may be advised for couples having recurrent abortions. All couples who have had a pregnancy loss should be seen by healthcare professionals and counseled. At this time, acknowledge their grief, which often manifests as anger. Many women have guilty feelings that should be recognized. They often need repeated reassurance that the loss was not a result of anything they did or anything they neglected to do. Women who do not desire pregnancy right away will need contraception. Reliable contraception for at least one year will be essential for women who have had a molar pregnancy. Teach the woman how to use the prescribed contraceptive method correctly to enhance effectiveness. Evaluation. Interventions are deemed successful and the goals and out expected outcomes are met if the woman does the following. Verbalize understanding of diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Verbalize the measures to prevent infection. Verbalize signs of infection that should be reported to a healthcare professional. Helps develop and participate in a plan of longer-term follow-up care. Hemorrhagic conditions of late pregnancy. After 20 weeks of pregnancy, the two major causes of hemorrhage are the disorders of the placenta called placenta previa and placental abruption. Placental abruption may be further complicated by disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Placenta previa. Placenta previa is an implantation of the placenta in the lower, lower uterus. As a result, the placenta is closer to the internal cervical os than to the presenting part, usually the head, of the fetus. The three classifications of placenta previa, total, partial, and marginal, depend on how much of the internal cervical os is covered by the placenta, figure 10.3. High-resolution ultrasound allows more accurate measurement of the distance between the internal cervical os and the lower border of the placenta as follows. Marginal, sometimes called low-lying, the placenta is implanted in the lower uterus, but its lower border is more than 3 centimeters from the internal cervical os. Partial, the lower border of the placenta is within 3 centimeters of the internal cervical os, but does not completely cover the os. Total, the placenta completely covers the internal cervical os. Marginal placenta previa is common in early ultrasound examinations and often appears to move upward and away from the internal cervical os, placental migration, as the fetus grows and the upper uterus develops more than the lower uterus. Incidence and etiology. The average incidence of placenta previa is 1 in 200 births, and evidence indicates that the rate of placenta previa is increasing. It is more common in older women, multiparas, previous cesarean births, and prior uterine surgery. It is more likely to recur if a woman has had a placenta previa. Other risk factors include Asian ethnicity, current use of cocaine or cigarette smoking, and male fetus. Clinical manifestations. The classic sign of placenta previa is the sudden onset of painless uterine bleeding in the last half of pregnancy. Many cases of placenta previa are diagnosed by ultrasound examination before any bleeding occurs. Bleeding results from tearing of the placental villi from the uterine wall as the lower uterine segment thins and the internal os begins to dilate near term. Bleeding is painless because it does not occur in a closed cavity and does not cause pressure on adjacent tissue. It may be scanty or profuse and it may cease spontaneously, only to recur later. Bleeding may not occur until labor starts, when cervical changes disrupt placental attachment. The admitting nurse may be unsure whether the bleeding is just heavy bloody show or a sign of placenta previa, particularly if the woman had no prenatal care. Digital examination of the cervical os or stimulation of contractions when a placenta previa is present can cause additional placental separation or tear the placenta itself, causing severe hemorrhage and extreme risk to the fetus.
Until the location and position of the placenta are verified by ultrasonography, no manual vaginal examination should be performed, and administration of oxytocin should be postponed to prevent strong contractions that could result in sudden placental separation and rapid hemorrhage. Therapeutic management. When the diagnosis of placenta previa is confirmed, medical interventions are based on the condition of the expectant mother and the fetus. The woman is evaluated to determine the amount of hemorrhage and electronic fetal monitoring, EFM, is initiated to evaluate the fetus. Fetal gestational age is a third consideration. Options for management include conservative management if the mother's cardiovascular status is stable and the fetus is immature and has a reassuring status by ultrasound examination and monitoring. Delayed births may increase birth weight and maturity and administration of corticosteroids to the mother speeds the maturation of the fetal lungs if needed. Conservative management may take place in the home or the hospital. Antepartum units are often designed to consider the woman's needs for a physical and occupational therapy and for the diversion as well as care for her pregnancy complication. Home care. Make a medical decision on home care versus inpatient care is difficult. Home care. Making a medical decision on home care versus inpatient care is difficult. General criteria for home care include the following. No evidence of active bleeding is present. The woman is able to maintain bed rest at home. Home is located within a short distance from the hospital. Emergency systems are available for immediate transport to the hospital 24 hours a day. The woman can verbalize her understanding of the risks associated with placenta previa and how to manage her care. Nursing considerations. Home care. Nurses are often responsible for helping the woman and family understand the physician's plan of care. Nurses help the woman and family develop a workable plan for home care that may include strict bed rest except for elimination and shower, the presence of another adult to manage the home and be present if an emergency arises, and a procedure to follow if heavy bleeding begins. Teaching includes emphasizing the importance of 1. Assessing color and amount of vaginal discharge or bleeding, especially after each urination or bowel movement. 2. Assessing fetal activity, kick count daily. 3. Assessing uterine activity as at prescribed intervals. and 4. Refraining from sexual intercourse to prevent disruption of the placenta. Home care nurses may be responsible for making daily phone contact to assess the woman's perception of uterine activity cramping, regular or sporadic contractions, bleeding, fetal activity, and adherence to the prescribed treatment plan. In addition, they may make home visits for comprehensive maternal fetal assessments with portable equipment such as non-stress tests and STs. The woman and her family are instructed to report a de decrease in fetal movement or an increase in uterine contractions or vaginal bleeding. Nurses should provide specific, accurate information about the condition of the fetus. For example, parents are reassured when they hear that the fetal heart rate is within the expected range and daily kick counts are normal. Nurses may need to help the family understand the physician's plan of care. For instance, the nurse may explain why a cesarean birth is necessary and why blood transfusion may be required. Inpatient care. Women with placenta previa are admitted to the antepartum unit if they do not meet the criteria for home care or if they require additional care to meet the goal of greater fetal maturity. When the expectant mother is confined to the hospital, nursing assessments focus on determining whether she experiences bleeding episodes or signs of preterm labor. Periodic electronic fetal monitoring is necessary to determine whether there are fetal heart activity changes associated with fetal compromise. A significant change in fetal heart activity, an episode of vaginal bleeding, or signs of preterm labor should be reported immediately to the physician. At times, conservative management is not an option. For instance, delivery may be scheduled if the fetus is older than 36 weeks of gestation and the lungs are mature. Immediate delivery may be necessary regardless of fetal immaturity if bleeding is excessive, the woman demonstrates signs of hypovolemia, or signs of fetal compromise are present. If cesarean birth is necessary, Nurses should prepare the expectant mother for surgery. The preoperative procedures are often performed quickly if the woman is hemorrhaging, and the family may be anxious about the condition of the fetus and the expectant mother. Nurses should use whatever time is available to keep the family informed. Additional personnel will be needed to prepare the woman for cesarean birth. Preparations include one or more IV line starts, administration of preoperative antibiotics, anesthesia, Foley catheter insertion, and fetal monitoring. Hematology or a team from the neonatal intensive care are usually notified and are present in the operating room for neonatal resuscitation. Abruptio placentae. Separation of a normally implanted placenta before the fetus is born, called abruptio placentae, placental abruption or premature separation of the placenta, occurs in cases of bleeding and formation of a hematoma, clot, 
on the maternal side of the placenta. As the clot expands, further separation occurs. Hemorrhage may be apparent, vaginal bleeding, or concealed. The severity of the complication depends on the amount of bleeding and the size of the hematoma. If bleeding continues, the hematoma expands and obliterates intervillous spaces. Fetal vessels are disrupted as placental separation occurs, resulting in fetal and maternal bleeding. Placental abruption is a dangerous condition for both the pregnant woman and the fetus. The major dangers for the woman are hemorrhage and consequent hypovolemic shock and clotting abnormalities. The major dangers for the fetus are asphyxia, excessive blood loss, and prematurity. Incidence and etiology. The incidence of placental abruption varies but is approximately 0.5 to 1% of pregnancies. Placental abruption accounts for 10 to 15% of perinatal deaths. The cause is not always known, but several factors that increase the risk have been identified. Maternal use of cocaine, which causes vasoconstriction in the endometrial arteries, is a leading cause of placental abruption. Other risk factors include maternal hypertension, maternal cigarette smoking, multigravitous status, short umbilical cord, abdominal trauma, premature rupture of the membranes, and history of previous premature separation of the placenta. Clinical manifestations. Although verification of placental abruption may be quickly evident, it is not always a dramatic or acute event. Classic signs and symptoms of placental abruption include the following. Bleeding, which may be evident vaginally or concealed behind the placenta. Uterine tenderness that may be localized at the site of the abruption. Uterine irritability with frequent low-intensity contractions and poor relaxation between contractions. Abdominal or low back pain that may be described as aching or dull. High uterine resting tone identified with the use of an intrauterine pressure catheter. Board-like abdomen, the abdomen feels firm to touch because of the blood that, cannot, that can be concealed. Port wine-colored amniotic fluid. Non-reassuring FHR patterns or fetal death. Signs of hypovolemic shock. Cases of placental abruption are divided into two main types. One, those in which hemorrhage is concealed, and two, those in which hemorrhage is apparent. In either type, the placental abruption may be complete or partial. In cases of concealed hemorrhage, the bleeding occurs behind the placenta, but the margins remain intact, causing formation of a hematoma. The hemorrhage is apparent when bleeding separates or dissects the membranes from the endometrium and blood flows out through the vagina. Amniotic fluid often has a classic port wine color. Figure 10.4 illustrates placental abruption with external and concealed bleeding. Apparent bleeding does not always correspond to the actual amount of blood lost, and signs of shock, tachycardia, hypotension, pale color, and cold clammy skin may be present when little or no external bleeding occurs. Also, the woman may have an undiagnosed hypertensive disorder that masks hypovolemia until late hypotension occurs. Abdominal pain is also related to the type of separation. It may be sudden and severe when bleeding occurs into the myometrium, uterine muscle, or intermittent and difficult to distinguish from labor contractions. The uterus may become exceedingly firm, board-like, and tender, making palpation of the fetus difficult. Ultrasound examination is helpful to rule out placenta previa as the cause of bleeding, but it cannot be used to diagnose placental abruption reliably because the separation and bleeding may not be obvious on ultrasonography. Therapeutic management. Any woman who exhibits signs of placental abruption should be hospitalized and evaluated at once. Evaluation focuses on the cardiovascular status of the expectant mother and the condition of the fetus. If the condition is mild and the fetus is under 34 weeks and shows no signs of distress, conservative management may be initiated. This includes bed rest and possible administration of tocolytic medications to reduce uterine activity and steroids to accelerate fetal lung maturity. Conservative management is rare and controversial, however, because of the risk of fetal death and maternal hemorrhage associated with placental abruption. Immediate delivery of the fetus is necessary if signs of fetal compromise exist or if the mother exhibits signs of excessive bleeding, either obvious or concealed. Intensive monitoring of both the woman and the fetus is essential because rapid deterioration of either can occur. Blood products for replacement should be available, and two large bore IV lines should be started for replacement of fluid and blood. Women who have experienced abdominal trauma are at increased risk for placental abruption. They may be observed for up to 24 hours after significant trauma, such as a motor vehicle accident, if they are not having any signs of bleeding, because it may take this long for a placental abruption to develop. Serial Kleihauer betke KB tests determine whether fetal bleeding is worsening. For the Rh negative woman, Rh immune globulin is usually administered to prevent possible maternal Rh sensitization. Nursing considerations. 
Placental abruption is frightening for a woman. She experiences severe pain and is aware of the danger to herself and to the fetus. She should be carefully addressed for signs of concealed hemorrhage. If immediate cesarean delivery is necessary, she may feel powerless as the healthcare team hastily prepares her for surgery. If at all possible, in the time available, nurses should explain the anticipated procedures to the woman and her family to reduce their fear and anxiety. Excessive bleeding and fetal hypoxia are always major concerns with placental abruption, and nurses are responsible for continuing monitoring of both the mother and the fetus so that problems can be detected early before the condition of the woman or the fetus deteriorates.